Thank you uh, very much, Charles. I, I want to make sure to, uh, let me just make sure I can uh, get everything organized here. Um, can you all see me and while I gesticulate and, uh, and hear me as well? Um, yes. Uh, I, I want to give uh, great thanks to Kate and Charles for inviting me again uh, to uh, these uh, great symposia. Um, and I'm definitely honored to be amongst all uh, such an august group of uh, forward thinkers and asking the, uh, as Charles put it, the, the deep fundamental questions that uh, need to be answered to address uh, not only our understanding of nature, but um, how we are progressing through time as a species um, and uh, uh, whether uh, we should be worried about confronting the Dragon King as uh, uh, Charles mentioned in, in Jim's, uh, Jim Jeske's uh, presentation. Um, Charles asked me a couple of weeks ago whether I could discuss uh, some of the uh, propulsion related uh, and force related investigations um, <clears throat> that I've been involved with uh, over many years. Uh, and this uh, presentation will be more like a, a short uh, chat punctuated by a few slides, uh, highlighting some of the many uh, concepts, uh, theories and uh, devices that I've worked on uh, with emphasis in this particular presentation on force measurements. I also have uh, uh, described in other uh, areas uh, and uh, other symposia, um, the um, investigation of energy uh, and, uh, uh, and power um, devices, uh, which I will touch on tomorrow actually uh, in um, the SSE uh, meeting that uh, is chaired by Garrett, uh, if that's of, of interest to folk. Um, and so I'll, I'll end with an overview of some of the uh, force measurement pitfalls that, uh, that I and uh, many others have uncovered uh, over, over years of investigation. Um, a little bit of background as, uh, as, as other speakers have, uh, uh, have um, started off their talks. I'm a, an EE uh, graduate uh, from the University of Toronto back, way back in 1974. Uh, and uh, I look back on uh, the fields and waves uh, section. I, I specialized in fields and waves. And I look at the kinds of, of, of nuanced uh, thinking that has uh, come across uh, my plate uh, since 1974 uh, till now. And I'd say, man, I would need another 20, 30 years uh, of concentration on just what has happened in that field of electromagnetics, or in particular, um, propagation electromagnetics. Um, it, it's unbelievable, really, what has happened. It's been exemplified uh, in great, uh, to great extent in these talks that, uh, uh, that Charles has put together here. Um, but uh, back to the 1970s, my father was uh, uh, on a business trip, and in the uh, in the airport, he picked up an unusual looking book uh, that, that uh, he, need, he would like, he wanted something to read on the plane coming back actually from, from uh, South America. And it was this uh, book called Worlds in Collision. And I hesitate to bring that up in some cases <laughs> uh, in this forum, but um, uh, I presume we all know uh, the uh, book Worlds in Collision, I'm going to assume most people do, by Emanuel Velikovsky, published originally in 1950. Um, I read that, my, my father said, you should read this book, it's rather interesting. Uh, it comes up with all sorts of different kinds of things uh, and understandings of, uh, of history and, and science, as it turns out, uh, than what he was taught and what, what I found out I was taught. Uh, I didn't happen to believe a lot of it, uh, but it opened my eyes um, to other ways of thinking. Uh, and uh, perhaps that kind of, uh, that, that kind of synthesis that uh, Velikovsky put together, right or, rightly or wrongly, uh, is the kind of thing that uh, Charles has been um, sort of hinting at in the, in the, kind, in the way we need to open-minded uh, new ways of, uh, of uh, assembling our, uh, what knowledge we have and delving into knowledge that uh, uh, on the fringes. So anyway, uh, as a result of that 
uh, book. Uh, there, there happened to be a, a group that came together uh, and published a uh, magazine called Pensee. Uh, in that magazine called Pensee one year, um, there was a little ad at, in, on one of the back pages by a guy named Ro Sigma uh, saying, if you want to find out the secret to gravity, uh, read my book. Uh, and it was uh, a, a book published by a guy named uh, Rolf Schafranke in, in uh, Germany, and it uh, highlighted uh, the T. Townsend Brown or the Biefeld, Paul Biefeld and Townsend Brown effect, uh, which a lot of folk I'm sure have, have uh, heard about. And uh, this started me thinking, wow, I wonder if I could actually replicate this, um, this thrust, this force device. And so uh, I uh, was able to, to try, oh, I put together an apparatus uh, which was, uh, would have been able to see it. I did not see any forces, but I certainly found out that uh, the rotation that I did get was due to something uh, artifactual, something spurious, namely, uh, it was uh, ion wind from the various high voltage connectors actually and cables that had gone to his gravitors. Um, so that actually set me on a path of uh, determining uh, how I could experimentally uh, verify or not these rather unusual, uh, and in this case, uh, the, uh, the word comes to mind is Zanizdat uh, experiments. Those are under the radar, as it were, not in, uh, not squarely in academy, uh, academic world, not squarely in the, in the uh, research, uh, government research world. In any event, um, in 1979, I started my own uh, little consulting company uh, based on um, the new ideas that I was finding uh, resulting from an investigation of, of, uh, uh, of Thomas Br uh, Townsend Brown. And uh, in 1980, uh, there was a symposium put on in Germany uh, by a medical doctor, Hans Nieper, uh, at which Tom Ballone, who, is, who was on this uh, in the audience yesterday and asked some questions, uh, and I went. And uh, in, that, uh, uh, in that symposium, there were all sorts of new ideas about forces and, um, and energy production. New ideas, unfortunately, uh, when examined close in close detail using uh, uh, more reasonable ways of, uh, of, of, of analysis, you might say more acceptable, a lot of them fell off the, off the chart. But uh, it prompted me to produce two uh, symposia of my own in North America in 1981 and 1983, um, and the results of, or, or some of the folk who uh, I uh, had at that symposium, I'll talk about in a bit. Um, then uh, I had, uh, uh, I guess, either the good fortune or the misfortune to uh, meet uh, John Hutchison, which uh, a, a person that uh, is rather infamous in the annals of unusual forces and uh, and um, uh, and, and gravity research, you might say. Uh, I wrote a small book about uh, more or less a pamphlet on my uh, involvement with John uh, from 1981 to about 1985, uh, during which time I was uh, able to verify that uh, he was able to produce rather unusual capability uh, in terms of uh, the destruction of matter, or, or sorry, of uh, the destruction of, of bulk materials, uh, the production of rather unusual luminescent phenomena, and the levitation uh, uh, of, of objects, uh, which I provided to him. Uh, I, I was there with a number of other folk witnessing these things back in the early uh, 80s, which I wrote about in the book. So that gave me um, another impetus to say, gee, there's, there's more here uh, in, in, uh, in nature, you might say, and the, the relationship between uh, nature and in John's case, I believe, uh, the possibility of a relationship between um, 
uh, physical forces and uh, consciousness, uh, which I can get into in a, a different, a different uh, uh, talk, uh, that um, uh, through various means, um, I became uh, associated with a European foundation that was interested in um, developing new energy and propulsion uh, methods. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, the funding stopped a while ago, but um, uh, during that time, I formed my current company, Hathaway Research International, uh, which provides an independent test ground for uh, those folk, uh, primarily inventors, uh, to vet and confirm their, uh, their discoveries. And uh, I also provide uh, with under uh, my company uh, uh, a method by which investors can determine whether a particular uh, uh, idea that they've heard in the areas of uh, propulsion or energy uh, may have merit. And um, let me make sure of the time here. Um, so what I've prim primarily been doing with uh, my little company uh, is being a bridge between the, the physics and the investment community. And that's not really been brought out here as, as much perhaps in this, uh, uh, in this symposium because here we're, we're looking at the fundamental physics. But unless it's possible to translate those ideas um, that we've uh, heard throughout this conference and other places, into a language and uh, a verification that is understandable by the investment community or the commercial folk um, whose job it is, is to take those ideas and produce something uh, that is of value to the quote average person. Um, it, it's difficult for those ideas to be, uh, to come to fruition and, and, and help humanity you might say. So my, uh, my job at the moment is to try to act as a bridge between the anomalous forces, as we're uh, as on the title here, and, and, and folk who are genuinely interested in investing uh, uh, toward commercialization. Um, whether that is actually the right path, given uh, the, the possibility of a, uh, um, a dragon king event, I'm not sure, but that's the way the world works at the moment. And um, so what I do is to try to confirm or deny um, using uh, the best uh, instrumentation that I have available uh, as an independent uh, researcher to bridge that, th those two realms. Um, so we work with uh, government agencies, universities, uh, groups, and individuals all along the, that path. The emphasis is on exotic, you might say, energy and propulsion ideas, but we also delve into all sorts of areas, which uh, you can see on the website, uh, uh, www.hathawayresearch.com. Now, most of the propulsion devices I've examined uh, are based on rather large scale or I call mesoscale systems, um, rather than the, um, the, the nano and the atomic scale sort of systems we've been dealing with or listening to in this uh, series of, uh, of lectures. And um, they, you might think that these mesoscale or larger scale um, devices, propulsion devices, uh, are, are relatively easy to measure because they're big. I mean, they're things like this, for instance, Jim Woodward's uh, device, which I'll mention very briefly, is like this size. It is something you can actually grab with, with measuring instruments um, that give you uh, reasonable results. Um, and you might think that's relatively easy to measure, but in fact, there are all sorts of pitfalls and, and problems that come about when you take what you think is a simple kind of system and you have to confirm that in fact it is doing what the inventor claims or the inventor hopes uh, has happened and it actually takes a lot of thought and a lot of effort as Jim uh, has been going through for decades to use him as an example um, 
And so what I've uh, done to, is to try to codify those kinds of pitfalls and, and nightmares in the art of measurement, uh, as I call them, uh, which I'll talk about uh, toward the end of uh, the, the discussion. So uh, let me uh, proceed here. Um, I generally have divided the kinds of experimental investigations uh, that, that we've done into theory-based or roughly theory-based and observation-based. Um, and uh, as I will point out a few examples here of what I call theory-based experiments in propulsion, Woodward, um, uh, Jim Woodward's uh, mock effect thruster uh, is a device which I'll show a few pictures of later uh, that uh, is based on a uh, Scamma uh, uh, understanding of Mach's principle and the, uh, the possibility that by altering the internal energy of a, of a body uh, in a sort of Machian field, uh, one might be able to produce a thrust in a particular direction, depending on how you arrange ancillary uh, uh, matter. Uh, in, in his case, um, uh, his device that uh, alters that uh, internal energy is a piezoelectric element. And that piezoelectric element can store and release uh, mechanical energy, which works against uh, particular masses. And in uh, the manner that uh, Jim proposes, uh, a thrust is able to be produced, which moves a body in a sort of an inchworm-like manner uh, in a particular direction. And Jim's gone to a great deal of, of trouble uh, and, uh, and forethought in trying to determine how, how this could be tested and how many ways it could be uh, falsified uh, and, uh, and, and has... Uh, actually now generated several other uh, methods of testing and, uh, and trying to confirm his, his uh, early um, understanding of, of Mach's principle and, and the, uh, uh, what follows from it. Um, I also uh, give a f just a, a few pictures of uh, uh, something Lance Williams and I had uh, been working on and uh, published, which Lance will probably discuss uh, later uh, in the morning, um, and uh, that is the uh, ability uh, or the hoped for ability using Kaluza theory that if you charge a body to sufficiently high charge, you might change its weight. Um, and it might be considered, you might look at it as buoyancy rather than weight. Um, so we put together a, uh, a, uh, an experiment to try to prove that. Uh, and at some point, if necessary, I can go through all the difficulties uh, and in, in, in confirming or denying that, uh, that hypothesis. Unfortunately, it was denied, as it were, uh, but we published the results uh, in, in a paper that Lance will no doubt uh, discuss. Um, I also want to bring up uh, uh, Fred Alzafon's work. Some of you may have heard of the Alzafon um, nuclear uh, spin uh, device uh, or, or uh, idea. And this is a concept uh, for those that are, aren't familiar in, in a few words. Uh, if uh, Fred, uh, Fred Alsafon uh, back in the early 80s, actually in the, the 70s came up with an idea that, wow, if you could use uh, vacuum fluctuations um, that uh, were in a uh, be between objects in a sort of a, um, a, a method that uh, that had saw fluctuations of the background field. He didn't call it uh, uh, zero point fluctuations until later. Uh, that caused uh, bodies to move together in a Lesagean sort of way, where there's more. It, it's almost like uh, a, a macro scale version of uh, Casimir effect where you exclude modes between two bodies and they actually move together with a force as is a crude analogy. 
but how to do that, how to change the fluctuation, the fluctuating field around an object. Fred uh, determined that um, from his understanding of fluctuations, if you were able to align the nuclear spins or the spins of the nucleons uh, in a sample um, using, in his case, dynamic nuclear orientation, uh, and then allow them to naturally uh, relax, not in a thermal bath. Uh, when they relaxed, they would suck up because they're going to a slightly higher energy state, a less, a more disordered state. They would suck up gravitational energy. And that was his, his bridge, you might say, between uh, gravity and fluctuations uh, or fluctuating forces. And so he proposed that if you could dynamically polarize um, the nuclei of uh, five have, let's say, high spin number, uh, like aluminum nuclei, um, and cyclically let them relax, then polarize them, let them relax, then align them, let them relax, et cetera, at a certain frequency, you could actually accumulate uh, a force uh, that looked like, and was for his case, all extents and purposes, a gravitational or an anti-gravitational force, which would change the gravitational attraction between one mass, let's say a mass up here and the earth. So uh, he proposed a number of experiments and participate and, and set up a number of experiments uh, to try to show that. And we did as well. I'll show a few little pictures of, uh, of our attempts, uh, our continuing attempts at, um, at, at uh, reproducing some of uh, uh, Fred Alzafon's uh, ideas and early experiments. I'll finish up if there's any time with uh, um, a, a uh, discussion of uh, uh, the Zinsser uh, electromagnetic uh, pulses in water as a possible uh, new form of propulsion. Um, so that is, those are some of the theory-based uh, experiments that we've involved, been involved with, very small uh, selection. Um, then there are observation-based experiments. I call it observation-based for lack of a better term. Um, and uh, uh, one of the ones that uh, I expended a, a fair amount of time on uh, was uh, a, a, an understanding by uh, Peter Grenot and his son, uh, Neil, that uh, if you could produce uh, intense underwater arc uh, explosions by discharging a capacitor underwater, um, that could produce an anomalous force. Uh, when I say anomalous, uh, it's, uh, it would be obvious to anyone that yes, okay, you make an arc underwater and you produce an explosion and a lot of water or fluid is discharged. But what is the energetics of that? Is it, why is it unusual? Well, Peter thought that uh, in fact that the energy um, that was released in breaking the hydrogen bonds to produce this fog of, of uh, material of water in this case that was ejected from this cannon with electrodes at the bottom was more, was greater than the energy in the capacitor that was uh, designed to, uh, uh, to, to, to produce this, uh, uh, this discharge. Um, I can discuss that in a little bit with a, with a photo. Uh, and um, uh, talk about it as well. Then there's the uh, famous forced precession gyroscope attempts of which there's a long history uh, predating uh, Lathwaite's famous uh, spinning, uh, spinning mass on the end of a stick. And wow, look, he could, it almost loses weight. It becomes so, uh, so light, he can lift something over his head in a circular motion, whereas he could hardly lift it when it's uh, not or it's spinning and uh, a spinning mass on the end of a stick. Um, anyway, looked to a lot of folk like, wow, that's a major breakthrough in, um, in gravitation. Why can't we um, produce a forced precession uh, gyroscope where uh, we take the main spin axis and start to move it and with some energy 
move it around, maybe that would produce a, um, a reduction in, in gravity or an anomalous force. And we have a couple of folk on the, uh, uh, who are looking in on this, uh, uh, at some of these presentations already, who are uh, really working very hard at trying to determine whether there are anomalous forces uh, being produced by uh, force precession gyroscopes. I, I call that observation-based rather than theory-based because uh, gyroscopic theory is well known uh, and, and there are all sorts of closed form solutions or there is a closed form solution to the, uh, the resultant force you get uh, from um, precessing masses, spinning masses, but none of them bridge the gap with, a, with gravity. Uh, or uh, producing an anomalous um, uh, unidirectional force. So that's why um, I call it observation-based because the, uh, as far as I understand, there are no physical theories that link uh, force precession gyroscopic motion to a particular force, uh, cumulative unidirectional force. Um, and then there's the famous collection of spinning superconductors, which we did a lot of work on and published a, a paper in Physica C on our uh, attempted uh, reproduction of, of uh, what Podkletnov was uh, attempting to do. So here are a few little pictures of uh, my romp through uh, these unusual forces and our attempts to bridge the gap, you might say, between uh, inventors uh, and investors trying to uh, bring some of these ideas to fruition. Here's uh, uh, where things get exciting. You're starting to build up a, uh, a piece of apparatus. You've got an idea. You put, throw this together with that and a 19-inch rack or something of that nature. Uh, by the way, this, these photos, uh, a lot of these photos are Polaroids. Remember Polaroids, by the way, um, before uh, this kind of camera. Uh, so they're a little on the dull side, on the out of focus side. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. But here's uh, daughter number one um, helping me uh, construct a, uh, uh, an apparatus for some kind of experiment and, and getting excited. And as you get excited about something, you, know, you feel more energized and uh, there's more, there's more uh, opportunities for uh, figuring out how to actually um, vet or critique uh, or measure this kind of uh, a new idea. Uh, and so as, as you go along, you, you finally do the experiment for instance, and then, um, is in, uh, in most cases, unfortunately, you run out of steam um, and uh, you uh, get overexcited uh, perhaps and uh, uh, you get tired. <laughs> so here's, uh, uh, here's what happens uh, uh, after a, a long day of uh, trying to get an experiment together and finding, damn, um, I'm stymied because there's this one little prosaic explanation which I forgot about, uh, and uh, uh, it it sort of uh, it it, it uh, rendered the claims uh, not quite as robust as the uh, the uh, inventor uh, had envisioned. Um, I referred to uh, Jim Woodward's uh, work. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, that that um, he is at least uh, discussed at this uh, symposium as someone who's thinking uh, uh, was really syncretic and forward thinking uh, and resulted in, um, in this book uh, of a couple of years ago uh, that uh, introduced uh, his theoretical concepts and the enormous amount of work that uh, he went to to try to uh, uh, verify that the device that resulted from his thinking actually produced an, uh, an anomalous force, uh, a, a unidirectional force. And uh, we were asked to um, examine it. And uh, there's Jim at, uh, with his device in an earlier version of his lab, the, um, uh, the, the uh, test chamber uh, in which uh, he has his, uh, his thrust 
uh, arm is in the plexiglass uh, cylinder on the left, and he's adjusting something on the, the vacuum system uh, there. And uh, he was able to show with his apparatus that there was a, 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 net, a net force that's still uh, uh, controversial. Um, we uh, put together our own version uh, of a uh, uh, sub-micronewton thrust stand, which has been published in uh, uh, the Review of Instrumentation, I believe. And uh, in that, um, in that uh, thrust stand, we used a different kind of pivoting system uh, that uh, I can go into the details uh, offline. Um, was a, a different way of detecting uh, extremely small thrusts. You can see one of Jim's uh, thrusters on the end of, uh, of a, a torque arm. Uh, it's the uh, device that uh, has the brass cylinder uh, with the, um, the aluminum ends on it. And uh, we were setting up for a test in this, uh, in this shot here. Uh, unfortunately, we did not see the kinds of uh, forces that Jim had claimed uh, that he'd seen in some of his apparatus. Um, but uh, he has now come up with another idea about how to demonstrate the forces using a pendular uh, system. And uh, we may be able to uh, uh, give him some assistance in understanding or, or pointing out some uh, measurement uh, issues that. Uh, uh, he may not have thought of in uh, his, uh, his demonstration of uh, unusual forces from um, uh, Mach effects. Uh, so um, referring to uh, uh, Lance Williams, the work, uh, and myself, Lance uh, will be talking about that in a little bit. It resulted in this uh, paper, the null effect test or the null result test. Uh, for um, uh, charges on large bodies. And in this case, we go to what I consider uh, the meso scale or the larger scale experimentation, uh, which um, Lance will talk about. I'll just show you a photo of, uh, of the setup that it took to, uh, to verify or, or uh, not verify, as it turns out, uh, uh, Lance's um, understandings. Uh, you can see uh, the, the, uh, on, on the right is the test mass that we are charging to a very high voltage, in this case, 200 kV uh, or, and above. Uh, it happens to be uh, an acorn-shaped uh, aluminum, a spun aluminum uh, mass that is suspended from the ceiling by a little white cord you can barely see. And uh, it happens to be resting on, a, a in this case, a, uh, a plexiglass uh, column uh, before we remove the plexiglass column and let it hang by itself. Uh, it's hanging from a, uh, a load cell uh, up on the ceiling about 20 feet above. And it's connected through a very uh, thin uh, conductor, which you can just see a little loop of between it, that acorn shape, and the top uh, electrode of a, uh, an electrostatic machine, a Van de Graaff machine. And uh, on the left, you can see a uh, required um, the high voltage uh, divider. It's uh, usually about a million. Uh, we can get up to about, about a megavolt uh, and measure it uh, pretty accurately, um, uh, which we use to measure the voltage uh, in stages as we uh, increase or decrease the voltage uh, that is applied uh, from the Van de Graaff machine to that test mass on the right. Just a, a little shot of uh, some of, of the apparatus that we put together to, uh, to verify or, or not the, the Calusa, the Neo Calusa um, understandings of, uh, of Lance uh, Williams, which you'll hear about. Um, I talked about Fred Alzafon. If you wish to read about a bit more about him, um, you can. Uh, uh, I, I can send you this uh, important paper, The Origin of the Gravitational Field. You can already see, if you can read it, um, uh, Creation and Annihilation of Charged Particles on a Subatomic Scale. And uh, they are 
basically his version of, uh, of vacuum fluctuations. Uh, a force field is generated by creation and annihilation processes shown to be attractive, proportional to the mass of the source and inversely proportional to the square of the separation. Um, this was when he was uh, at Lockheed. And a little later, um, he produced this now rather famous um, paper uh, uh, at, uh, when he moved to Boeing in 1981. And uh, this uh, described uh, how he proposed using what I uh, described earlier, uh, using dynamic nuclear orientation uh, as a method of actually uh, uh, showing that there was some anomalous gravitational uh, activity or influence um, on uh, the local gravitational field from sucking up gravitational energy or fluctuation energy using uh, dynamic nuclear orientation on uh, polarized nuclei. And we uh, have been uh, doing that experiment for a long time now. Uh, it's been on and off. You can see a little bit of it here. It requires uh, a large DC field, which you can see the electromagnet, uh, or one pole of it uh, um, in the center, uh, in that gray, um, um, that gray pole piece. Uh, it requires uh, liquid helium uh, cooling to get rid of the thermal uh, agitations uh, so that only this gravitational uh, influence on, uh, on the uh, uh, on the matter uh, can uh, result uh, and uh, high vacuum and and uh, pulsed uh, uh, microwave fields in this case S band and what we're trying to do in a cavity is to weigh the uh, or look at the change of weight of this little uh, sapphire uh, bead which is uh, our source of uh, of aluminum ions. Uh, uh, aluminum atoms. Um, and uh, so this is a, these are a few little pictures uh, related to that experiment. Um, I think I'm going to skip over Zinsser because I'm getting short on time uh, and the kinds of things we had to do. There's Peter Grenot and myself setting up for an experiment um, which uh, uh, was based on Peter's understanding of uh, or his thought that, in fact, the hydrogen bonds being broken by this underwater arc um, produced a fog. And it was the fog of small particles that propelled uh, out of uh, this cannon, which he's looking at right there, and would produce this anomalous uh, thrust. Well, later on, uh, it, it was hard to believe for me when we did the experiment. And later on, uh, I showed that, uh, in fact, the it wasn't fog that was emanating from the uh, electrodes, but um, it was uh, what normally would be considered a shock wave. It was shock waves that a shock wave that moved toward the surface of the water produced Taylor instabilities, and it was the Taylor instabilities that produced the fog that produced that uh, showed a shower of fog, uh, and that unfortunately set the uh, uh, energetics. Um, uh, back and it was no longer uh, an over unity device, you might say. And I uh, had to publish a retraction from some of the uh, publications that I had uh, uh, done with, jointly with Peter uh, and his son, Neil. So unfortunately that didn't work. Uh, once we understood the actual nature of what was going on in the, uh, the plasma. Um, here is an example of uh, on the left, a seven inch uh, several hundred pound um, uh, force precession gyro on the left, uh, sitting on force uh, on load cells and generating virtually, the only thing it generated was a lot of noise um, and uh, no anomalous thrust that we could see. However, I was charged with making sure that that was the case. We made our own system on the right, uh, about a uh, quarter scale model and went through a number of tests uh, showing, at least uh, in the case that we had, uh, that there were no anomalous uh, thrusts, uh, unidirectional or otherwise, in a, a force precession gyro arrangement. Uh, other folk might uh, be uh, able to show 
um, uh, show something different, but we'll see. Here are some Polaroids again, unfortunately, of our uh, Podkletnov project, uh, which resulted in that Physica C paper. You can see Eugene Podkletnov uh, in the top right uh, um, uh, photograph. He's uh, bending over with the white shirt, uh, taking a look at uh, our liquid nitrogen attempt. Uh, and there's Dan Alzafon, Fred's son, uh, actually looking through the uh, analytical balance. And uh, the, uh, let me see here. Uh, um, we can uh, also see the uh, liquid helium insert uh, in the bottom right uh, that we used uh, to uh, spin the superconductors of six inches that we made in the lab uh, under uh, Podkletnov's uh, tutelage, actually. And he claimed that all of our setup, including the superconducting disk, uh, should produce the force that he claimed to have seen, namely reduction of weight above the spinning superconductor. Now, a lot of other folk, uh, including NASA, tried to do the same. Uh, as far as I know, never got to uh, actually spin a superconductor, a levitated superconductor uh, in a liquid helium bath. We managed to do it. Uh, we did not see any forces or any uh, gravitational reduction um, and, and publish that result. Um, and just uh, as a final interest, um, Pod Kletnov also uh, suggested that uh, he had seen uh, set up a, a system, a high voltage system that uh, could produce a force beam, a beam of forces, whatever that means, um, uh, from a superconducting disk uh, uh, that uh, is placed between two electrodes at high voltage. Here we are with uh, 600 kV of Van de Graaff's either side of a, a test device. This is the only one actually I've ever seen that anyone's produced. There's a close-up of the uh, superconductor with its uh, liquid nitrogen bath behind it. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, set up uh, in one of those uh, Faraday enclosures behind uh, a whole bunch of strips of, uh, of toilet paper <laughs> uh, to see whether uh, the beam so-called could penetrate the Faraday cage and, and flutter the, the uh, toilet paper, which we thought would be a pretty, uh, um, uh, a, a pretty sensitive method of seeing whether there are anomalous forces, we saw nothing. Um, but uh, there's a long story behind the Podkletnov uh, system. Uh, I'm just gonna finish off very briefly because I'm running out of time. Um, that uh, for those who are interested, I have compiled a, uh, a list of uh, of uh, pitfalls that uh, are common in measuring small forces and even larger forces. And they can be categorized into these uh, uh, at least seven, um, seven areas that uh, we've found uh, to really confound uh, measurements of the type that are required to make sure that uh, a, uh, an inventor can with confidence, go to an investor or someone else and say, I know that I have seen an effect that is measurable, is reproducible, it can be independently verified, and it's uh, devoid, at least to the largest extent possible, of, of potential prosaic explanations. And so uh, things like mechanical effects, uh, this is all very dense, and I, you don't need to read it, but you can see like the, uh, there are all of these issues that we have come across and others have come across with regard to measurement uh, of, uh, of anomalous, basically small forces. Um, thermal expansion, number six, thermal expansion during warm up of a test mass, uh, causing increase in buoyancy if you're doing a, a test uh, such as so many people were doing with superconductors immersed in liquid. Um, and uh, very, and, and Martin can talk about that too, uh, because he was involved with a lot of this, uh, this kind of uh, superconductor experimentation. Uh, and uh, let's see, anyway, we can go through a lot of it um, offline, uh, should people be interested. Um, and I have, uh, I, I, I've, encountered a lot of these myself in the kinds of systems uh, and, and measurement uh, uh, 
the measurements that we've done here on trying to confirm or deny the kinds of uh, proposals and ideas that uh, folk have come up with. Uh, so I will zip through this quickly. Uh, and those who are interested uh, can email me, perhaps I can be happy to send this. Although I understand that Charles is going to be, since it's being recorded, um, this will be available for folk to go through should they wish to uh, in more detail. Um, and so uh, with that, I am going to close it off for, look at them all, goodness, it never stops. Huh. Um, <laughs> to uh, ask questions. Please, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, George, for, for sharing some of your the work you've done over the years. Um, so many, you know, it's so nice to see the testing of all these things that people have claimed and uh, have seen and and it's just so you know i'm holding up your book here okay i don't know if everyone can see right mind bending uh about hutchinson and so here's here's a case where these things happened and totally unexplainable and not repeatable especially once he got well um none of this could happen anymore and unfortunately you know he, he he you know tried to make it seem like he could still do things but these things actually happen so therefore you know kind of starting maybe not starting but like a huge impetus to your journey of man there is obviously something else out there that we don't understand and now you know you've run through some of the things you've tested and you have not found something that uh, actually is anomalous in the end. And um, could it be that it's not repeatable? And that, for example, you it requires the intent of the, um, the person doing the work associated with it, and they do see effects. And then other people try it, and you know that you don't see effects anymore. Um, it's kind of an out there thought, and I, you know, I'm sorry for everyone for for bringing that up, but you know, I've wondered about that myself, and um, you know, with, with things that I've seen. Well, it's it's a uh, yeah. It, it would take a couple of days actually to answer that question in any sort of detail uh, because it involves um, an acceptance to first order of the the very possibility that there could be a, a, a human interaction in something that is so gross, uh, a, a gross activity like uh, flinging a, uh, you know, 50 pound cannonball uh, up or levitating it in, in front of you, uh, which uh, I've seen, I, I saw with my own eyes, these kinds of effects. And I also saw the effect, you might say that the effect had on John not only the effect that John had on it, but there was a reciprocation. And depending on one's mindset, uh, oh, sorry, on John's mindset, it could either happen quickly, like within a couple of minutes of him turning on a, his apparatus and thinking about it, or it would take six hours. So in that sense, it's temporally unpredictable. Uh, it was also physically unpredictable uh, too, because uh, sometimes the apparatus would not work the way he wanted. You could see obvious uh, things breaking down. There would be little fires uh, going on in parts of a transformer uh, that uh, confounded any kind of what we'd call reasonable measurements. The only thing that we had to go on was give him a bar of aluminum he puts it in the field. I watch it. It breaks apart. I take these two things and look at them, and it's all weirdly broken apart and stuff like that. And that's my measurement. I, I can look at it with an SEM. Uh, I can I can do an analysis of the fact that it, you know, th there were all sorts of grain boundary dislocations and things like that. But I have no idea of of any reasonable 
physical connection between the apparatus and John and the thing that is being broken or lifting up. And in this case, he's not the only one that has demonstrated these kinds of things that I'm aware, that I have been aware of. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that, uh, but he's the most spectacular uh, version of that. Uh, and uh, uh, as I say, this is, uh, talking about John is, takes up a lot of time and right. uh, I didn't have that kind of time. Yeah. Or you don't have that kind of time. Well, let me ask one more question. Um, and that is through, you know, all the different things that you've seen and tested, what do you feel, what does your gut tell you is the most promising and where people should be looking? Well, I, in terms of forces, I think, uh, um, but several of the, uh, the uh, Casimir based ideas that we've seen already today, uh, or sorry, uh, in, in this uh, conference uh, seem to be of, of great promise. Uh, I would also like to think uh, that, I would like to hope that the, uh, that Alzafon, uh, who has not been uh, examined with the, in the depth that, uh, that I believe he should have been, uh, might, hold, uh, might hold promise as well. Uh, because we've seen in our earlier experiments uh, with dynamic nuclear orientation, we've actually seen some unusual effects, some unusual physical movements of a test mass uh, under the influence of dynamic nuclear orientation that can't be explained by uh, 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 Einstein, de Haas, or other kinds of, uh, of um, uh, approaches, you might say, that might have been involved in, in uh, looking at these weird things that we've seen. Uh, I can't ascribe them exactly to a gravitational uh, or a mass law, a continual mass loss because there was too much noise in the system. But um, it's, it's the kind of experiment that, the Alzafon experiment is the kind of experiment that goes from the, the large scale down to the small scale um, whereas the kinds of uh, experiments and, and physical ideas, physics ideas that have been discussed in this uh, symposium start in the small and then hope to grow into the, into the large scale that can be use, useful. So I like to look at both, uh, both approaches. Uh, that's the long-winded answer yeah. to your question. Yeah, thank you, yes. Uh, so we have some uh, questions here. So uh, Dr. Solomon. Uh, yes, I want to make just a couple of quick comments. Over the last couple of decades, I've spent a lot of time with some of the more of the fringe type physicists. And uh, there's a lot of things going on. Number one, they tend to be incredibly eccentric people. Uh, uh, much more so, I mean, everyone that's at this particular conference is fairly, very straight. They're, they're like, I would call perimeter uh, to the much more conservative establishment. But when you get into frontier, when you get into fringe, you get into all sorts of people and uh, their stuff not only is not that reproducible, but they themselves are difficult to deal with. Even if they're physicists and know a lot of math and know a lot of physics, they're very paranoid. There's a lot of areas that they don't know. They're very adamant about what they do know. Uh, they're very mysterious many times, uh, letting their information out in little dribs and drabs. And um, I, I made a pledge that the next time I'd ever deal with such a person, I would have a team of psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, some various an interface that could handle this person at that personality level. Uh, my cousin, Judith Scutch, who founded the Parapsychology Foundation, that's how I first met Uri Geller and watched him bend spoons. And uh, uh, she helped fund the original Hal Putoff work at, 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 that then uh, through the Noetic Institute that she founded with the astronaut. And um, uh, she basically, the, the work done with, uh, with uh, 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 Uri Geller, uh, the only thing you can now say the guy's worth hundreds of millions of dollars having found minerals and oil uh, for people. So basically uh, you then have Hal who I've spent many, many hours with discussing Ingo Swan and the experiments that went on in his laboratory. And you say, well, my God, this happened. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why? And they just didn't. And so a tremendous, that's why I really got to give my uh, tremendous respect to George, who has the rigor and the thoroughness and really looks things through. Not that Hal doesn't, but in certain instances, like with Ingrid Swan, 
uh, it, it just wasn't followed through. Uh, Uri Geller still remains a mystery. So all I'm trying to simply say is that, that back in Newton's day, when he got on to the Royal Society, they said, look, Newton, we know you were a metaphysician. We know you were into alchemy when you first started. But listen to me. Physics is the Royal Society. Metaphysics is the Anglican Church. And there is a separation. And you cannot break that placenta separation at all. Well, today, it's not that clear cut with these fringe folks. And, 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 and there really should be a project that would really get in and study them just as the one that, that uh, George had, uh, had uh, uh, many years of his time devoted to uh, and, and say probe it and find out what was, what's really going on there, especially in this very difficult to reproduce phenomena. So it's not, not just metaphysics and physics that we have now with but we have this whole other eccentric, weird, uh, one of a kind type of stuff. And I think there's some serious stuff in it but it's very hard to ferret out. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, so, uh, uh, Dennis, you have a comment or question? Yes, uh, thanks, George, for uh, what you bring to the industry uh, and the new energy uh, movement. Um, I was wondering, since I, I had a close-up view of Cold Fusion and LENR, if you have had any interaction in your testing with, uh, with anyone doing LENR work. I know the preparation of the surface of the palladium was an issue and that kind of got resolved, but uh, have you had any experience there? Yes, um, I'll be discussing uh, LENR a little bit uh, tomorrow. Uh, if you're able to uh, attend, uh, I'm uh, presenting at about three o'clock, um, the, the, the energy side, of which this is the propulsion side. Uh, tomorrow will be sort of the energy side of uh, some of the stuff we've been doing. And uh, I will introduce uh, uh, the so-called mother of all calorimeters, uh, MOAC, uh, which in which uh, we, uh, I participated in, although I didn't develop it myself, um, a, a lot of LENR attempts uh, that uh, um, for various reasons, mostly experimental, uh, did not show the kinds of effects that their uh, originators claim. So if you can stick around for tomorrow afternoon, um, there'll be a more fulsome uh, description of, of, of my involvement there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, hi, Aiden. Um, you have a question? We have just a little bit of time for maybe one short question. Right. Um, yeah, over the holiday weekend, I worked with uh, Mr. Sokol at uh, Falcon Space on improving our Alzaphon experiment. Um, I guess it's more of just like a, a, a statement. Um, I mean, we've, we've, we're getting to the point where uh, I've introduced computing into his setup. We're uh, starting to use LabVIEW uh, in order to take measurements and record everything live as it's going. Plus, we're dumping results on uh, either in YouTube or one of our other uh, channels, but we have uh, one of the other experimenters associated with the APEC group is this Wayne Ohala, uh, and he's has footage of um, physically pumping weight out of an object um, via like an easy Alzaphon experiment, and it's like starts at like four point nine grams and gets down to like four point well four point nine nine almost five grams, and he gets it down to about four point eight nine grams so uh, uh, what a, a, a tenth of a gram he was able to pump out physically um so there seems he's has had some success with alzaphon um mark and i over the holiday weekend we fried some some of the material samples but uh we do we finally do have a high enough powered uh of RF generator in order to, to start experimenting with a little more force and, and such. So if, if you guys you know pay attention to APEC over the next month or two, and we should hopefully have more results on the Alzaphon experiment that are made public. Um, and we're just we're getting more rigorous as as uh, time goes on with it. So yeah, do you do you guys have plans for publishing those results? Um, so that other people can take a look at them and, and yeah, weigh in. Yeah, Mark was working on a report. Um, 
let's see and he was going to share it or send it to me i got a yeah, I'm thinking of, you know, like submitting to a peer reviewed journal, even, um, you know, so one, one thing I want to point out is that the Society for um, um, SSE, my mind failed me thinking of scientific exploration, scientific exploration, uh, there's potentially going to be a special issue associated with this conference, uh, both the, the talks on Saturday. And then also the other talks here. So, Aiden, that might be a, a, a place where you could find peer reviewed publication, but maybe a little more open minded to things that are out of the mainstream. So, that's something you might want to consider uh, okay. submitting an actual paper to so that um, you know, we can follow the scientific process and have other people take a look at it, weigh in, uh, right. try to replicate it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, the gathering the equipment to get into that range for the Lamar, Lamar force and the dynamic nuclear orientation is not easy. Um, we were salvaging out of um, <clears throat> Sandia's, uh, one of the traders from Sandia, the uh, warehouse, um, they, they go through equipment uh, at the labs, right, and right. out, those guys, Solano traders. Um, no, uh, before I get too far away, uh, Wayne Ohala, his YouTube channels fail forward research. Um, so I recommend everybody, you know, you can jump on YouTube and it's just fail forward research. Yeah. So, but, you know, once again, I just want to emphasize that, you know, doing like what Jim Woodward does, what Lance mm -hmm. William has done what uh, Mike McCulloch has done, what um, you know, others, uh, Sonny White has done, is that they put the information out there and they put it in a place, in a journal, not a YouTube talk, but a journal where others can actually take a hard look at it. And, and then that's the way you get feedback and you get improvements. And you know, so I, I would really, um, I, I would encourage you and your team, you know, the folks at uh, Falcon the Space. Doing stuff, yeah, Falcon Space, to really seriously consider that. And that, that's the way to whole, move the whole community forward. Um, and so, you know, just, and I appreciate you guys uh, trying and pushing all these, these uh, ideas because there is really something there. Um, so anyway, okay, well, thanks again, George. Um, uh, very much appreciated and uh you know maybe martin will also discuss some of the things that he's been through and trying to look at these alternate propulsion devices and um hi martin i'm going to stop the recording because i know that uh um that that you um due to your constraints of your university it's not possible to uh, record the session so let me stop the recording now